I don't know about you, but as an indie artist, I've had a lot of questions when it comes to the legal side of publishing and creating music. Do I need to copyright my music? How do I go about copywriting my music? What about samples? What am I able to sample legally and what is illegal? How do I go about acquiring the rights to sample from, say, movies, TV shows, audiobooks, and more? And how much is that going to cost? What about covers? Can I just upload a cover to YouTube? It seems like that's what everyone's doing, but is that actually legal? And what are the consequences of doing that? Also, what about trademarks? Do I need to trademark my band name? What if someone else tries to take my band name? Or what about logos, album art, and more? These are all questions I've had and in searching online, I've not really been able to find satisfactory answers to a lot of these questions. There'll be people that will attempt to answer some of these, but their answers either aren't very thorough or they always have the disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer, so go talk to your lawyer if you really want to know the answer. And I'm thinking, yeah, because everyone just has a lawyer that they're just paying on retainer, right? Uh, and then I realized, actually, I do know a lawyer, and that is Adam Woodward, who is actually my brother-in-law. And I had the chance uh, to sit down with him and interview him and ask him about all these different questions when it comes to the legal side of creating and publishing music. So this is a really awesome interview. I learned a ton and including some very positive, very encouraging things about um, sampling, for example, in, in particular. But you also learn a lot about copyright, what the process is for um, uploading covers, and also why you might want to consider trademarking your band name and more. Now, because this interview is kind of long and just so jam-packed with information, I don't want you to miss anything, and maybe you don't have the time to watch the full interview. So I put together a handy cheat sheet or checklist um, that you can download in the description below that will kind of give the cliff notes of all the interview and kind of give you the key action steps and points uh, that you want to take away from this um, when it comes to protecting yourself legally, wh whether it comes to copywriting, sampling, covers, trademark, and more. So I highly recommend you grab that free guide. Again, it's in the description below, or you can just go to orpheusaudioacademy.com slash legal, and you'll get that handy cheat sheet. All right, with that in mind, let's go to the interview. Reagan Ram here with Orpheus Audio Academy, and I have my brother-in-law, Adam Woodward here, who is a lawyer, and he's going to help us tackle some legal questions when it comes to our music. Hey, Reagan. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So always, always good to have a lawyer in the family. Uh, there's no lawyers in my family, actually. So I, I'm the, I'm the end, I'm the end of it. Right. <laughs> so I'm glad to be there for, for you. And uh, so, yeah, I'm Adam Woodward, Reagan's brother-in-law. I married his older sister. Don't hold that against me. And I uh, have a background in engineering. I went to Cornell University and studied engineering. Uh, before that, actually, I worked, did a lot of work with my church. I would edit audio recordings, and I took classical piano for six or seven years, learned basic music oh. theory. I don't think and, I knew that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I was a Learning amateur already. musician. <laughs> yeah, amateur music, musician, and I worked briefly with Audacity, which became Adobe mm -hmm. Audition. So I know a little bit about that area of technology. And of course, I'm an engineer uh, by training. So, you know, programming and technology kind of come naturally to me. That's why I chose to go into intellectual property. law. So I am a intellectual property and registered patent attorney with the law firm of Holmes Frazier in here in Naples, Florida. I have our office down on fifth where I primarily specialize in patent and trademark work, but I also have a background in copyright. And uh, when I used to live in Tennessee, I did copyright litigation for Pitts and Lake. So with that being said, um, let's jump into any questions that you might have regarding copyright yes. and how to navigate the legal complexities. And I can even start out with a, a primer on what copyright is and how to distinguish it between the three other children in the intellectual property family. Sure. That'd actually be interesting for me. Um, just kind of giving an overview of mm -hmm. what copyright is and what that really means. Yeah. So it's important to understand copyright. It's important to understand the place that copyright occupies in the family of intellectual property, as I call it. Like any family, there are some similarities, but each person is their own individual and they stand apart from others. 
um, but there are common threads that unite all of them. Intellectual property, broadly speaking, is that area of law dedicated to protecting intangible uh, property, uh, ideas, concepts, know-how, um, these kinds of things that you can't go out and, you know, stake a flag on. Intellectual mm -hmm. property in law is in contrast to real property or personal property or tangible property. That would be like real estate and mortgages and, you know, leasing that backhoe you might use to carve up your backyard or something. You know, it's all real property or personal property. Intellectual property is a whole different beast. Now, the four areas of intellectual property are patent, copyright, trademark, and the often ignored trade secret. And secret. each, yeah, trade secret. It, each one is devoted to solving and protecting a specific kind of valuable asset that the human mind can create the, and then exploit for profit in the marketplace. Intellectual property is inherently oriented towards business, um, towards solving business problems. Although of the four kinds of intellectual property protection, the copyright and then patent are probably the least dependent on some kind of commercial transactional uh, application. So uh, first area of intellectual property, which is kind of my favorite, is patent. Patent protects, the way to think about it is, is useful functional ideas and uh, inventions. Patent exists to protect the function of something. So if I invent a, you know, a musical recording or a musical composition that's an expression, it's not functional. It doesn't do anything. But if I invent a new form of sound equipment, if I invent a new and, comp a new and novel method for producing audio or visual works, uh, and it meets the certain thresholds required by patent law to be original, not obvious, not an abstract idea, but, you know, some new system. Or if I invent a new instrument, that could be patented. But, okay. uh, you know, it, patents protect things that do things. Now, you can have design patents. You know, if you come up with this really cool new design for a record, you know, it's maybe it's different. It, it has an aesthetic component to it. But, you know, the grooves are etched in the vinyl differently. And it has some functional aspects, some aesthetic aspect. That's a cool area of overlap where you could maybe get a patent on that and a copyright and possibly even a trademark. Yeah. So, cop so patents are utility, you know, devices, machines, compositions of matter, drugs, plants even. You can hybridize right. create a new plant you can patent that that's patent so then with music are we things. dealing more with the the copyright area yes. then okay yeah so next up is copyright and these are kind of in order of i don't know complexity and financial uh, situation patents definitely the most complex and patents only exist they only exist when the government says so you only have a patent if you go through a long process with the patent and trademark office mm -hmm. And they issue you a patent, and then you ha only have it for a limited number of time, a limited amount of time. You get 20 years from the day you submit your application. But that is in direct contrast to copyright and trademark. And I know we, you didn't ask any questions about trademark, but if you're in the music business, if you're generating logos and album art, if you've got you know uh, different images or even a band name, uh, okay. those are all really important trademark issues. And you want to make sure that along with getting your copyright protection, you're also getting your trademark protection. So well, we get to trademark in just a moment though. So next up, the, the me thing, the thing we're here to talk about is copyright. So whereas patents are issued, patents are issued. That means they don't exist like a magazine is issued. It doesn't exist until it's published, until the, the patent and trademark office issues it. Copyrights are not that way. Copyrights are registered. Like you'll register a car. You still have the car. The car still exists before it's registered. And that's an important distinction. Copyrights are not created by filing something with the government or by doing something with the government. That helps. That helps to be sure. But copyrights exist the same way when you build a chair or you build something, you make something with your own hands, you automatically own it. You don't have to right. tell anyone, this is mine. 
However, if you register it, like when you register the car, it gives you certain rights and abilities and helps you comply with certain formalities that you might need later on down the line. Yeah, so, that was a question. If we could just linger there for a second mm -hmm. about um, copywriting, like should you go about copywriting your songs and copywriting your music? That's something that I personally haven't done yet because I know, like you said, you automatically, when you create something, you mm -hmm. have the copyright. Um, and I guess I'm not uh, too worried about my music being so amazing that people are going to go and steal it at this point in time to kind of just have an extra layer of protection. If you get into some kind of dispute, mm -hmm. that's where it's helpful to have a copyright. Would that would be what you would say? So I'll share with you a common phrase in the law for regular property, and then it's intellectual property uh, variation. You know, there's this phrase in the law called possession is nine tenths of the law and holding on to something, having something, uh, possession is a really important component of ownership. When it comes to copyright, trademark, trade secret, first in time, first in right. And just, I want you to remember that phrase, first in time, first in right. And so in any dispute about almost any form of intellectual property, patent, copyright, trademark, trade secret. If two people say, no, I own this. No, I own that. Well, the question always comes down to who did it first? Who did it first? And how do you prove that? Can you just come out and you know say, well, here's my here's a piece of paper. Uh, these are my notes when I was recording the song. Here's the metadata from my audio file from my recording software. Yeah um you know you you have to go to court and someone's like no this is mine and you say no this is mine well it's the reason why we register one of the big reasons we register copyrights is to put a official government date stamp on our works the you receive the government receives this you can tell them when you made it but if that's in dispute at the very least the government will say yeah okay you tell me you made this 10 months ago eight months ago two years ago Okay, send me some proof if you want me to assert that. But at the very least, no one is going to be able to dispute your claim that as of the date of filing it with the copyright office, you are the creator. And if anyone comes later and says, no, I invented this, they're going to have a high hurdle to jump over when they say, I created this, if you've got that official government date stamp. Okay. So it's just a, it's just, just a way of giving official government date stamp. Now, if you right. don't want to do that, copyrights are not that expensive. They're cheaper, I believe, than trademark registrations or patent registrations. Patents being the most expensive. But if you don't have the time or f or energy or money to register your copyright, there's a trick you can use that mm -hmm. can be very helpful and is legally relevant. The trick is take your work, your sheet music, your audio recording, something like that, seal it in an envelope, send it by certified mail and make sure the seal is tight, put a wax seal on it if you want, send it by certified mail to yourself, to yourself. You will get an official US government stamp of date mm -hmm. on that document, on that envelope, as long as it's unopened and untampered with. That gives you basically the government's uh, official date stamp. If you ever came up, if there ever came up at a dispute about when a certain work was recorded or not, you could pull up that envelope and say, Your Honor, this has a USPS postmark date of October 5th, 2021 or whatever, and or 2018. And this person says they invented that, says they created their copyrighted work um, after that. Mm -hmm. Well, here. Open the envelope and you can see for yourself that as of the date of that postmark, I my work was fully formed and fixed in a tangible medium. And that's, that's really the important. Yep. Yep. So I mean, that it's probably more hassle than just going online and because that's how you would do it to copyright your music. You go, you just do it online through the. Yep. So I'll get to that in just a moment. Okay. The, the, the first thing to remember though, before you register, a copyright, you need to make sure you have a copyright. And the way you get a copyright is not registering is one way of proving and showing and that registration kind of removes all doubt. 
doubt. That's the why you register. You register to remove all doubt about your copyright. Okay. However, technically, copyright exists, and here's here's the magic phrase, the legal term of art. A copyright in a given work exists when that work is fixed in a tangible, when that expression is fixed in a tangible medium. And that's a little technical legalese, but copyright protects expressions, not ideas, concepts, principles, underlying facts. It ex protects expressions that are fixed, you know, not streamed, not in transit, but fixed in a tangible medium. So, would, so as opposed to radio waves or something like that, a, so that fixed in so a tangible medium, if you had a recorded awesome. song that would, would that count as holding the, yes, the trademark, a hard drive, the copyright, hard drive, flash memory, piece of paper, vinyl disc, um, laser disc, CD, DVD, a fixed in a tangible medium means a physical object that holds the data the information that fully encompasses and represents your creative expression. So okay. patents protect concepts, ideas, methods, compositions. A patent can protect not just your way of doing it, but also the underlying idea itself. But copyright is really just about your way of doing it, your personal expression, your own personal take on the thing. So uh, this is an, an important distinction because it, what it means is there are two different copyrights in any particular musical work. And that's important to remember. There is a copyright in the underlying music, the, the, the score, the composition. Uh, I tend to think of it as the song rendered in like sheet music form, like it, right. the, the base concept, the arrangement, the, arrangement, yeah, the music, the notes. Yeah. yeah, the music, the lyrics, the notes, and the conceptual expression of it. Mm -hmm. There's a separate copyright in the audio recording. But just to recap earlier, your copyright, your rights in a copy, your copyright is the right to copy. It is just like what it sounds, um, exist when you make your expression, and you fix an intangible meaning. So you record your song, you record your video, you write down your novel, you fill in the blank, you draw and paint your painting. Then it's fixed in a tangible medium. The canvas and the paint, tangible medium. The pen and the paper, the typewriter, the printer, the Word document saved on a hard drive, tangible medium. The audio recording file, the, uh, the samples, the master, anything. So that's when the copyright exists. Now say, I want to prove that I created this expression at a given time. Well, then I register and registration gives you multiple rights. When you register, you gain the right to sue someone for infringement. If you find someone who's copying or ripping off your work, you can't sue them until you've registered hmm. because you have to, before you use the power of the government, to enforce your copyright, you have to show the government that you do in fact own that copyright. And so that's the effect of registration. So it's, you know, it's a right that you have, but you can't do anything with it. It doesn't have teeth, as we like to say in the law, until it's registered. Registration okay. also gives you interesting ability. You can file your registration with US Customs and Border Protection, actually, and you can prevent yeah, uh, infringing copies and pirated copies and other things of your work from crossing the border, uh, okay. from entering into and out of the country. And you don't have to spend like hire a lawyer or sue anyone to do it, which is typically how you enforce copyrights. So then I guess the long story short, then you would recommend getting a copyright on your music because you just you have a lot more control over what happens to your music when you have that copyright mm -hmm. registration. I do. I, I recommend registering your copyrights. It's not very expensive. Um, and, but failing that, make sure you have a very official, formal way of establishing the date and mailing a self-addressed stamped envelope to yourself is a good, you know, ma mailing an addressed envelope to yourself is a good way of getting an official government stamp. But, you know, there are other ways, you know, just think to yourself, if someone asked me, well, prove that you recorded this October 5th, 2017, 
how would you do that? How would you prove the date? Um, and then, you know, well, I know your in like your, your audio doll, like say I, like I use logic pro to record my music. It has a date on when it was created mm -hmm. um, and that's the file helpful. structure. So that's helpful. But as anyone with a programming background knows, unfortunately, metadata is subject to manipulation. You okay. can manipulate the metadata in a lot of files. Now, if a file is encrypted, that's good. If you if you have an a way of storing your music files, your original recordings in an encrypted format, such that the metadata can't be altered to show, say, an earlier date or a later date of composition, then that would also help. I guess shifting gears into the the concept of um, borrowing from other people. Uh, mm -hmm. So, what's the kind of the legal procedure? Say, if you want to like sample, say, like a line of dialogue from a movie or a TV show. Um, a big artist that that does this is Pogo. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's Australian and all his music, which is I really like his really cool music. He makes all his music from old movies. Basically, he'll take dialogue or even music from the soundtrack and then he'll rearrange it to make his own songs and he'll add in maybe some bass and some drums. It makes these really cool arrangements built out of like Disney movies and things like that. And so that's really cool. Um, but I haven't heard him talk about like how he gets the rights to that. So I was wondering if I wanted to do something like that or just even um, taking just a small clip from like even like an audio book or a movie or a TV show, or whatever. What is the process for that? Like, are you is there a certain like length that matters on how much you're taking? Um, do you have to pay someone to get the right to do that or just what goes into all that if you're wanting to sample from other people's works in your music? So this is a complicated question in copyright uh, because what you're doing, what you're doing is what's called a transformative use. So if you're sampling, if you're just sampling one song to use in another song, that's a really straightforward licensing transaction. And there's a great tool called Tracklib out there to help people who are sampling their music get licenses. But that's going from one form of expression to the same form of expression, song right. to song transformative use when you're taking uh, uh, a movie or other line of dialogue and converting it into a song you're essentially taking one kind of expression and turning it into another that gets in more involved in fair use sampling songs to use in other songs is straightforward commercial use especially if you sell the music so you have to pay a small licensing fee and then agree to a royalty distribution uh, unless your use is so tiny, like think one or two seconds or something, that it, it's hard for anyone to argue that it's infringing. Using movie dialogue and other things like that is a lot is a lot more fact dependent. But in a nutshell, the concept of copyright fair use is that there are certain forms of copying that don't negatively affect the economic market for or the commercial interests of the uh, original creator such that they're an exception to the general copyright rule. Remember I told you intellectual property is oriented towards commerce and, and business. Right. So inevitably when you're evaluating any kind of intellectual property dispute, the question of in this use of my idea, in this taking of my idea, are you gaining an unfair economic benefit at my expense? Are you harming the market for what I'm trying to do hmm. by taking my patent, copyright, trademark, whatever? And fair use comes about because there's a class of copying that we say, well, yes, this is technically copy, but it's an exception to copyright infringement because it's fair use. So the classical examples of fair use are educational, news, commentary, parody, hmm. That's how Things people like on that. YouTube can get away with, you know, doing commentary on different films exactly. and showing clips. Exactly. Reaction cause... to videos. Right. I'm uh -huh. reacting to you. I'm taking your expression and I'm commenting on it. I'm parodying it. I'm reporting on it. And therefore, even though I'm sampling significant segments of your copyrighted work, I'm not an infringer because it's fair use. And it's, you know, transformative use is kind of is similar to, to fair use. It's where you're taking something you're like, I've so transformed this from its original standpoint that it's no longer really copyright. 
you know, it, it's not the same thing. And no one who's buying my work or using my work is doing so as a cheaper way or a different way to get your work. Right. And that's kind of the key thing, you know. So it's so, not like you're making a bootleg copy of a, of the movie, and someone's going to go listen to your song instead of watching the movie. Right, right. So it's it's parody, it's transformative use. So odds are, I and I'll double check this for you, but odds are he probably doesn't have to seek copyright clearance for any of. That's what I was works. wondering because he doesn't talk at all about it. He even put together a movie talking about how he does it. We didn't say anything about getting the rights to use the clips from the movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as with any, uh, as, as with any lawyer, like, you know, let, let's be careful before we go mm -hmm. and say, yeah, go ahead. Copy away mm -hmm. because I don't want to make sure says, we can just rip off. <laughs> <I everyone's> said. <laughs> stuff. But transformative use is one of those particular complexities of copyright law because it's like copying, but it's not because we're going from one medium, one form, one expression to another, and the markets are not the same. Right. I don't buy as I don't buy one of Pogo's songs because I really want to watch Jungle Book, you know, mm -hmm. or you know, the Princess and the Frog. I buy his song because I, I'm interested in music, not movies, but I think it's cool what he's doing. So this case is literally hot off the presses from about three weeks ago, which is basically yesterday in legal terms. <laughs> August 24th, the Second District Court of Appeals brought us a, a fresh and a revivication, a reminder of what transformative use in the context of copyright really is. A transformative use like parody, like uh, educational news commentary, these are all the various branches of fair use. Uh, transformative use is using a work in a different form for a different purpose uh, than the original. So the name okay. of the case, the name of the case, you should can look it up and read it for yourself, is the Andy Warhol Foundation for Visual Arts Incorporated. Andy Warhol Foundation for Visual Arts versus Goldsmith. And if you type in Andy Warhol v. Goldsmith, you'll get the same. You'll, you'll find the case. But essentially, it came down to print illustration of a famous musician, prints. Um, they weren't sufficiently transformative to support a fair use defense. But, you know, this is good news because they almost made it. And here we are. Okay. Interesting. So the original photo here on the left was created by a photographer, I believe it's Linda Goldsmith. Miss Goldsmith created this portrait, this photo of Prince. Later on, Andy Warhol, being so impressed with Prince's music and the painting, went and created the image on the right, and then went about selling. Andy Warhol passed away. His estate, his foundation, owns the rights to this copy, to this image on the right, and they were using it and selling it, selling the prints. Uh, Ms. Goldsmith said, hey, that's my work. You can't do that. Um, and they said, no, 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 this is new. We, 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 it's a parody. It's, it's a transformative use. We, not a parody, but, you know, we, we're trying to do something mm -hmm. different, something artistic. And the case has a lot of interesting language. It's not, it's not just legalese for lawyers. It's a good case to read because it kind of goes through for the artist describing what is transformative you know it, it's the it's the purpose of the work it's the um idea the original market for the work and one of the things that weighed against andy warhol here andy warhol's foundation is the fact that the market for prints of photographs and the market for prints of art created from photographs are very similar right um i might buy if i really like prints I might buy a copy of Miss Goldsmith's photograph. I may also take the slightly more artistic version and buy Andy Warhol. But because I like prints and I want to hang him on my wall, and these works are close enough so, yeah. that one could be said to affect the market for the other. So it'd be more, this would kind of be, you know, more congruent to take sampling someone else's song and using it in your song versus taking audio from a TV show, a movie, and putting that into your exactly. music. Exactly. Those are qualitatively different things. 
um, when you transform the use, you're like, I'm taking a creative expression used or sold for one reason, and I'm incorporating it into a new work used and sold for a typically different reason. All right. So, well, that's really um, encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. So transformative use is the name of the game. And as you can see here, epic fail. <laughs> and so <laughs> there was a lot of disgorgement of profits, a lot that Andy Warhol had to pay. Although the case is not actually fully resolved until they get word from the Supreme Court that they deny certiorari, where the Supreme Court says they don't want, they're not going to take the case. So this is still pending, but uh, I haven't checked to see if the Supreme Court has said we're not going to take it. If the Supreme Court says no, then the ruling stands and they're going to have to shell out the money. Hmm. Interesting. So yeah, so that's an important thing, but that's encouraging because there was, this took appellate review. This wasn't an issue that was resolved by a trial court. It had to go up to the big wigs right. because yeah, so, it was such a close call. It was right, such so a close if, call. If this is close, then you know you're pretty safe as a music artist sampling exactly, from movies exactly. and TV shows. They awesome. almost got, they almost got it, but the purpose of the work was substantially similar. Um, and so no transformative use. So there you have it. Once awesome. again, disclaimer, I recommend you should always seek the advice and mm -hmm. consult with yeah, an gotta, attorney. <laughs> gotta keep yourself safe. Yeah, yeah always consult mm -hmm. with an attorney yeah. about issues where it's borderline like this. Mm -hmm. so if we could just talk quickly about like doing a remix or a cover, um, mm -hmm. what's the process for that? Because we see tons of people uploading covers of songs to YouTube, and I'm pretty sure they didn't go about getting the legal right to do that. And my understanding has been so long as it doesn't like blow up, um, that even if you're technically violating the law by doing that, um, you're, you're pretty much safe because people aren't the record labels or whoever owns the rights aren't going to come after you. Um, that's kind of the advice that I've heard, but what's your take on what the, the best process is going is for, uploading a cover, uploading a remix to YouTube, because that is a great way to grow your music fan base as you're um, creating your own spins on music that's similar to what you're making. So now you're you're getting their fans exposure to your music. It's a great, great way to grow, but what's the best practices for going about doing that? So once again, you have that you do have the concept of transformative use. So if you're using a different arrangement, different musical instrument, maybe different vocal cadence, different style, the fact that you are using the same notes, you know, transformative use can sometimes help you there. But I need to pause for a second because I want to check, I want to make look something up before I, I make a firm recommendation on that. All right. So we had to introduce what we had to do a little digging because uh, it's a strange phenomena that there's widespread uploads of covers on YouTube that are infringing copyright. You can't replicate someone's song in substantially the same way without uh, without trouble. You know, that's a violation of copyright. However, YouTube creates a whole new legal layer on top of what would otherwise be copyright infringement. And it sort of intercepts and profits from your copyright infringement by giving you permission ahead of time. What a lot of people don't know is you, you name the artist, you name the song, you say, I'm covering this person. And rather than just shut you down, I think YouTube and the big record labels realize, now, wait a second, we can make money off this. If you upload a YouTube video, the only way you're going to make money is through ad revenue. You're not distributing copies. That would probably cause it. You're not right, selling you copies selling directly. It. If you're mm -hmm. selling copies directly, that would probably get the record companies to come off you. But you're not. You're Unless it on you went YouTube. to like Harry Fox Agency, that's when yes. that's where you want to get that that mechanical yeah. license Harry, to be yeah to if exactly. you're be selling copies of the cover yeah yeah and and record labels typically have to grant mechanical licenses they don't have to grant sync licenses which is the right to perform the song over video so mm -hmm. a video of you singing and performing it would probably require a sync license so the important thing here to know is that most of the record labels have a deal with YouTube where the YouTube algorithm detects their music in a cover or regular format being performed, I believe it automatically starts sharing ad revenue with them. So you won't probably get as much ad revenue. You may not get any ad revenue from uploading a cover 
Um, I'm not a YouTube content creator, so I don't know how those contracts are right, work out. YouTube is its own sort of copyright universe because technically mm -hmm. as a publisher, they have to abide by copyright law, but to streamline things and to prevent the proliferation of copyright lawsuits, YouTube has stripped things down and made things a lot more straightforward. They're not always as inclined to recognize fair use or transformative use, and they don't have to. The copyright law tells you what someone can sue you using the government to enforce. But YouTube as a private entity can take down and remove videos at their will as long as it's not a violation of their terms and conditions. So you might have something that is perfectly acceptable from a fair use context and a court would affirm you in that. But mm -hmm. YouTube as a private business entity has made the calculation okay, yeah, maybe you can get away with this, maybe not, but we don't want to be in the middle of a lawsuit where someone has to try to figure that out. So we're going to just cut right. it. We're going to make it straight. We're going to make it straightforward. This is how a lot of people's videos that contain brief clips of movies or other things like that often get taken down um, because the copyright holder is right. a bigger business partner with YouTube than you are. And even if it's doesn't technically violate copyright law, YouTube would rather keep their bigger customers happy. Yeah, so, that's a big problem with Rick Beato, who's one of the biggest um, music YouTubers uh, on, the, on the platform, is he'll break down what makes a song great. And he'll, usually they're like older, like rock songs. And a lot of times he'll run into problems with his, his videos getting taken down by YouTube. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's just yeah, but of, that's commentary. That's commentary. It's uh, right, it should be covered. It should definitely be covered because by it's YouTube. Groups. They can kind of do what they want. So be aware that you'll need a litigate. You'll need someone who's versed not just in copyright, but also in commercial agreements and in the YouTube terms of service. This is an area I am working on getting proficient in and I hope to be able to help people if they have their just if they have their creative works wrongly class misclassified by YouTube and denied uh, on copyright grounds. Well, that's definitely a good area to move into because I think that's the fastest growing industry right now is the creator economy. With, Absolutely. You know, YouTubers, bloggers, even music artists and people creating art. So yeah, well, shameless plug, industry. shameless plug for my firm, Holmes Frazier. We have a lot of attorneys with copyright experience and uh, we like to help people nationwide uh, handle their disputes. We have offices in Michigan and in New York, as well as here in Florida. And we like to think that we offer the best intellectual property service at you know, the most reasonable price we can. Excellent. So well, this has uh, been really awesome. But absolutely. did you want to dive into trademark things? That was kind of yeah. a new area that I hadn't even considered. Absolutely. So going attention. back to the overarching framework, pat, the, the four children of the intellectual property family, patent, copyright, trademark, trade secret. So the These buzzwords. Aren't, aren't the children of the, the four writers of the apocalypse, are they? <laughs> no, they're not, thankfully. <laughs> So the, you know, the patent, he's the nerdy kid, he, you know, patents protect your creative, your not creativity, they protect your functions, your designs, your useful things, your useful things are protected by patent. Uh, copyright is for your expressive things, your expressions, your creative works, those are protected by copyright. Fun fact, though, if your thing is both expressive and functional, you can get both. For instance, computer code. Computer code is both expressive. It has, it's, it's uh, creative, it's expressive. There are many different, just like there are many different ways to write a book, there's many different ways to write a software program. But it's also functional. It has uh, design, utility, and purpose. So there are cases in which you can both copyright and trademark, or you can both copyright and patent a piece of computer software. So useful things, patent. Creative things, copyright. Trademark is commercial things. Commercial expression is a good way to think about trademark. When you're trying to identify your goods or services to the general public, you have a reputation, you have a brand, you might use a logo, a color scheme, a word, a phrase, a design of packaging. That's called trade dress uh, to distinguish yourself 
from others in the marketplace and signal to consumers, hey, this is the real deal. This is the stuff. Um, there's collective marks, there's service marks, trademarks, collective marks, certification marks. Um, and But the general overarching principle of trademark is helping consumers discern the identity of a particular brand, helping consumers know who's making this and what is its reputation. Trademarks are incredibly big business. Just think of Louis Vuitton, Gucci, mm -hmm. Disney logo, denominations of origin, designations of origin, being able to signal this item or this service comes with the benefit, the experience, the skill, the prestige of a particular company, person, brand, carries with it a lot of economic value. There's a reason people rip off Louis Vuitton bags and Gucci clothes mm -hmm. and things like that. So when you are a creative artist, you know, odds are you aren't just going to be made, odds are you're not just putting your work out there for people to just enjoy for free. You know, you can still get a copyright in that case, or you do a creative commons license where people can use it however they want to. You still have your copyright. But if you start selling, you start selling your goods or selling your services as a record producer, a label, a studio, um, either the goods of the musical product produced or the services of production, you've entered into commerce and you want to distinguish yourself from those around you. You have a brand, you have Orpheus Audio Academy, mm -hmm. Unity Game, Andromeda Coast, uh, Rachel Ram Fine Art. These are denominations, these recognize who you are and what you do. That's a good time to register a trademark. Trademark, like copyright, does not come into existence because the government says so. Copyrights are registered. Trademarks are registered um, because that's an Im implication that like your car, which exists before being registered with the government, the government is recognizing something that already exists. So to create a copyright, you fix something in a tangible medium. To create a trademark, you use a name, a logo, a color scheme in commerce. And there's not a, there is, it's incredibly broad, the kinds of things you can trademark. For instance, recently, or not, not so recently, but John Deere trademarked that distinctive green and yellow color scheme they use. They actually trademark green and yellow uh, in the use of farm equipment and all the goods. If someone tries to go out and make a tractor and call it Bob's Tractors, but he decorates it in that green and yellow John Deere distinctive color scheme. Doesn't matter. He never says John Deere. Doesn't matter. He mentions them. Mm -hmm. People are going to look at that tractor and say, oh, that's a John Deere tractor. You know, whether they see his name on it or not, John Deere is going to sue him for trademark infringement because mm -hmm. they got the, they got the color. And what's interesting is if your product or service becomes synonymous with the generic idea of something, you lose your trademark. For instance, Kleenex is a made up word. Uh, mm -hmm. Kleenex is a brand of tissue. However, their brand was so widespread, so pervasive that facial tissues came to be called Kleenexes, regardless of whether they were made by mm -hmm. Kleenex or not. And Kleenex actually lost their trademark on that term because it was synonymous with something that's generally descriptive. And so that is one of the lodestar, that's the lodestar of trademark, is it has to be distinctive. That's why companies often make up weird names, eBay or Amazon, as used to describe, you know, sales of something. If you called your company Amazon and Amazon Lumber Company, you may or may not be able to make, get a trademark on it if you were a company that cuts down trees in the Amazon. And someone else came along and said, I also want to be Amazon lumber. Like, well, we're all cutting down trees in the Amazon for lumber. Our name just describes really basically what we are. You can't, you typically can't mm -hmm. trademark things like that unless okay. you can show that you've acquired some kind of distinctiveness. Yeah. So, I went about getting a trademark for Kingdom Pen. So that's one of my other businesses. Excellent. So yeah, the logo, I think, I, I think the color scheme. I can't remember what all was involved. Did you ago. file? Did you file and get it yeah. issued? Yeah, I did file it with the government. Yeah, register it. Yeah. So then, Wonderful. how would so then? What are some maybe some practical ideas then for music artists and how they might potentially want to go about like trademarking 
their brand. Definitely trademark your band name. Uh, you know, as far as musical, so you want to trademark it in a couple different categories. Uh, a band yeah, name. You, real you quick, want to tra- I st- if I can stop you there for a second, because there are bands out there that there's uh, have the same name, right? There's um, especially if you're like looking up on Spotify, right? You will search for a band, you can find several different bands with the same name. So, but if you own the trademark, are you able to then have the power Dude. to? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, the trademark rights and intellectual property rights generally are typically exclusive. They're exclusionary rights. They're negative rights. They're not often positive rights. Like you own a trademark in something, but, you know, doesn't necessarily give you the right, give, ensure that you will be able to sell or make your business profitable just because you own the trademark. But it does ensure that you'll be able to keep other people from being successful okay. or profitable using the name. So yeah, if you see a bunch of different, my name. <laughs> yeah, if you see a bunch of different bands with the same name, they could be in different countries with different governing laws. Um, trademark is country specific, although there's something called the Madrid Protocol, which allows for the international registration of pro, of uh, trademarks through the World Intellectual Property Organization. But it's somewhat complex, and you do still need to file separately in each country. So different bands with the same name can come out of difference of nationalities. It can also, sometimes you can have different bands that use the same name in the same country. It just means no one has gone about trying to register that trademark yet. Okay. Now, if one of those bands decided, hey, I don't want anyone else using my name, they can file a trademark registration. And they will have to disclose to the trademark office that, hey, there are other people using this name, but I believe I have the right to exclusively use this name in commerce because I did it first. I was the first one to release a rec. I was the first one to sell a record using this name. I was the first one to sell tickets to my live show using this name. And that's the interesting thing where you need to remember trademark is specific to a given class of goods or services. Delta makes faucets for your kitchen. Are you familiar with the company? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Delta makes faucets for your kitchen. Delta Airlines has planes and flies you around. They both own trademarks in Delta. They both own the Delta trademark. But a trademark is not for all goods and services that could be sold under that name. It's only for all goods and services that you sell under that name and that could reasonably be confused. No one who's going to buy a faucet is going to mistakenly think that Delta Airlines is going to sell them a faucet. And no one who goes to get on a plane or looking to travel somewhere is going to mistakenly think that Delta Faucets is going to sell them a plane ticket. Likelihood of confusion is essential in establishing your particular trademark area. So there's about 44 or 45 different classes of goods and services under the international NICE, uh, NICE, I can't remember how you pronounce it, N-I-C-E, it's French, uh, convention that designates all the different goods and services that people can register trademarks under. The United States follows that treaty convention. So, for instance, as a band, you're probably going to want to trademark your name under multiple classes. You're going to want a trademark on uh, the class of goods that includes uh, musical recordings, streaming downloads, CDs, audiovisual recordings. That's a class of goods. And you're going to want to get a trademark to protect the goods that you would sell with your band name. However, if you offer live performances, if you are, uh, you know, you go to someone's wedding and you'll perform for them. Uh, if you go on tour, if you offer, you know, mentoring and help for money to up and coming musicians, things like that, that's a service and you'll want mm-hmm. a service mark. Now you can have one trademark service mark. People often use trademark interchangeably to include trade and service marks because the lines are blurry. But technically, when you're selling services, it's a service mark. When you're selling goods, it's a trademark. Okay, interesting. But in one application, you pay a separate fee for both, but you could say, take for instance, uh, the Rolling Stones, and in one application designate multiple classes. So international class five, international class 10, international class six, and each of those would correspond to a different class of goods or services. You'd issue your mark and then you could go apply it. You know, you could sue anyone or or exclude anyone who was using that name to sell any of those particular goods or services. Okay. Well, that's 
definitely very eye-opening, very enlightening. Definitely oh, learned a lot there. And, and fun fact, trademark and copyright do overlap substantially because logos are both right. a creative expression and can be used in commerce. So if you write, if you make the, the example that came to my mind is you write, you make some really cool album art. It's an original expression. You have uh, designed something really cool and neat, and you would both want to register your copyright in that new original design and trademark it because you're going to be selling it in commerce. And technically, you know, if if someone copied your design uh but maybe didn't sell it maybe someone just started giving away posters of your album art they took your they liked your album they liked the album arts so they started making posters and giving them away to their friends if you had a uh trademark registration on your logo your album art where you were selling your cds you couldn't sue them you couldn't sue them for trademark infringement because they were selling, they were using your logo. They were using the thing that you had trademarked, but they weren't making any money. They weren't right, using it in commerce. The, right. no, no money was changing hands. So that's the important component of trade in a trademark. Mm -hmm. No harm, no foul. But if you had both the copyright and the trademark on your album, your album art, then you could sue them because even though they weren't selling the posters or just giving them away to all their friends, that hurts your market. Or you, you like, hey, well, maybe I'm not selling posters now, but if there's a market for posters, if people want posters, I, I want to make posters of my right. own original art and I want to sell them. So by creating a derivative work, a poster of my album art, you are harming the market for my creative work. Exactly. You know? You know, like I'm not just selling an album. I'm selling it at the music CD. People are buying my, of course, you'd have to argue. Well, people are buying my album, not just for the music. They're also buying it because they like art. Um, right. and, and these posters hurt the market for that. But the copyright would give you the ability to go after anyone who's potentially okay. affecting the market for your creative expression. And the trademark gives you the ability to go after people who are using the same design in commercial, in business right. transactions. Okay. So yeah. So yeah, maybe, yeah, as you're a small artist and you're just getting started and you don't have to worry about these things, but as you start to grow, definitely get those mm -hmm. trademarks, get those copyright registrations. So absolutely, this has been yeah, really awesome, really eye opening. definitely learned a lot. And I think it's been really beneficial. I'm glad to help. And it's important if you're not at the point where you can afford an attorney or you can afford to register your trademark or your copyright, uh, trademark registrations typically start at around $250 per class. And that's just the filing fees. You also have to pay an attorney to draft and do the research and stuff like that. So bare minimum, $250 for a trademark. But you can establish for the purposes of later trademarking your work that I was the first to use this in commerce. Just try to think about date stamps. You know, okay. take a picture, write a document to yourself, certify it, mail it to yourself. Say, hey, I sold my first blank today using this name, using this logo. Have someone sign that piece of paper. Have someone witness it. Find a way to create a public rec. Find a way to create a record that uh, an independent third party could verify. You know, like you can use the whole trick of mailing it to yourself in the envelope and getting the postmark on it. The point is for trademark and for copyright, you just want to someday be able to go to the government when you do have the money to register your copyright or register your trademark and show first use. Mm -hmm. trademark uh, you, you want to show first use in commerce good thing to do would just be to save your receipts or your invoices for a trademark mm -hmm. if you you know a couple years down the road you want to register your trademark save your first receipts say hey look i first used this in com i first used the name andromeda coast in commerce on july 5th 2019 because here's a receipt for my first sale my first digital audio download or something like that that creates a record that sh receipts show use in commerce okay. so that later on even if someone registers a trademark before you you come in and register your own mark and say yeah i mean i know they registered before me but look 
I can prove that I was first with my receipts. And the trademark office will make that other trademark go away and give it over to you typically. But oh, okay. if you have the money to hire, you know, hire an right. attorney, or go through that process. And mm -hmm. it's the same with copyright. Someone That's has really a copyright cool. registration, you can yeah. come behind them. It's definitely a really interesting, unique, you know, practical tip that I never heard of before. So that, that's really that's really cool, so especially if you said right, you're not ready to to really spend the money on all that that, that extra stuff mm -hmm. that you need. So awesome. Glad I could help. Right. Oh yeah. So yeah, thanks so much for coming on and doing this interview. And uh, if you have any other legal questions, post them in the comments below, and maybe we'll have Adam back on to answer. So thanks so much for your time, and uh, see you soon. See you soon. Wow. I don't know about you, but that was an incredible interview. I learned a ton and I feel much more informed, much more uh, secure in my legal decisions when it comes to my music. So thank you once again to Adam for coming on and doing that. And if you have any questions um, that you want clarified, be sure to post those in the comments below and I can either ask Adam or maybe we can have him on in the future to answer those questions. And like I said in the beginning, um, there's a lot here and so if you don't want to forget anything or you're trying to remember what are like the first steps you want to take um, depending on what legal um, side that your music falls into whether it's sampling or getting your copyright um, I have a handy cheat sheet that you can grab for free it's in the description below or you can go to orpheusaudioacademy.com slash legal and get it there all right I hope you enjoyed the interview I'll see you in a future video and be sure to keep creating